uh, can I welcome you then to this seminar? I, I think other people will kind of drift in as time yeah. goes on, yeah. but uh, we will make a start. My name is Michael Gold, um, and this seminar is on uh, the information and consultation of employees regulations 20 years on, 2002-2022. And the reason for the seminar is because it is exactly just over, actually, 20 years since the um, U European Union adopted its directive on informing and consulting employees across the member states. Uh, and the directive passed in March 2002 became law in the United Kingdom in 2005 and was implemented through the Information and Consultation of Employees Regulations. And ICE is often abbreviated to ICE. So we talk about the ICE regulations in case you're wondering what ICE stands for. Um, and it was phased in uh, to cover all companies with 50 employees or more um, by 2008. So it's been in, in force, fully in force, about 14 years in the UK. And it covers, uh, in theory, you know, about 75% of the UK workforce. And what we want to do in this seminar is just to look to see how effective or indeed how ineffective the directive has been over the last 20 years in both the UK and in Ireland, um, the countries which it was mainly aimed at. Um, so I will start with a, a brief examination of the role of joint consultation committees in the UK and works councils across Europe, um, because it's against that background that we have to understand the directive. Then after that, Aline Conchon uh, will explain trading the expectations of the directive at the time and give us an update of the current situation in Europe. And then um, Brian, began will talk about the situation in Ireland and Tony Burke on the situation in the UK um, and then there'll be ample time for discussion observations at, at the end. Um, a particularly warm welcome to those of you uh, if you haven't attended the History and Policy Forum uh, seminar before um, and particularly if you're from outside London or indeed one of our international speakers or international audience um, the advantage of Zoom is it does allow you to expand from London across uh, across the globe, actually. Um, so a very warm welcome to all of you. Um, if you want to know more about the, the work of the History and Policy Forum, then there is a very good website. They put History and Policy Forum into your search machine, your search engine, and it'll bring up what you need to do. Now, before introducing the three speakers, just some very quick housekeeping notes. Um, it is a Zoom seminar, uh, so there might be the occasional problem. And if I suddenly fade or disappear, or there's a uh, inter internet, internet connection problem, um, I hope John might take over uh, briefly as the chair. Um, however, I, yes, thank you, John. Um, uh, then um, please mute unless you're speaking, because there can be a background noise as well, as we know. Each speaker, um, or well, Aline will have about 15 minutes or so, and then Tony and Brian will have about 25 minutes. So, or let's see how it goes. Uh, um, and as I say, we'll have a good time at the end for a discussion, at least half an hour, if not more. If you'd like to make a contribution, either kind of turn your video on wave or else use that little button at the bottom that kind of puts a, a thumbs up or a hand or something um, and uh, I'll call you uh, but what I might do at the end if there's a lot of questions I might take some of them together in order to make the questioning a bit more streamlined. Um, also I should just point out it, that the seminar is being recorded and I hope you're okay with that um, and then uh, unless there are any further questions from any of you um, I'd like to introduce the three speakers, um, and we are extremely grateful to them um, for, for their time and effort in, in, in coming. So, uh, you know, a, a very warm welcome to Aline, Tony, and, and to Brian. Um, Aline, who will speak first, is going to speak about the union expectations of the ICE Directive and where we are today. Um, Aline is the Senior Policy Advisor at Industrial Europe, uh, which is the Tr European Trade Union Federation of Manufacturing, Mining, and Energy, Work Energy Workers. And she coordinates Industrial Europe's work on uh, vocational education and training, and also in the area of, of company policy, which is policies aimed at supporting trade union action in multinational companies. And she's been involved in the area for about 15 years and is, has developed a high level of expertise about employee participation. Uh, Brian McGann, who will speak on implementation of the ICE Directive in Ireland, is head of organisational development 
for the Irish Union, that is the largest Irish trade union, SIP2, Services Industrial Professional and Technical Union. Uh, he's also head of SIP2 College and executive director of the Ideas Institute, which provides upskilling training for SIP2 members and has a long standing interest also in employee participation. As long as he says 40 years experience in the private commercial city state and health sectors in Ireland, of which 30 years has been spent in all sectors of the Irish post office and post. Um, and then Tony Burke uh, will speak finally on implementation of the ICE directive in the UK. Uh, Tony is former assistant general secretary of UNITE uh, here in the UK and also currently president of the Confederation of Shipbuilding and Engin Engineering Workers uh, Unions. Uh, Tony worked in the print industry and was um, a, a, a assistant general secretary of Amicus, which later merged with Unite, um, and, but really is one of the few trade union officials in the UK who has a great deal of expertise about this particular directive, having been involved at the practical end of its implementation in the UK. And so we're extremely grateful to him too for coming along. Now, having said all that, I just want to say a few words, and they will be a few words, about the origins and significance of the directive itself. Um, I, I just really want to explain by way of background where the directive has come from and, and why we're discussing it now, you know, what, what its significance is. Um, and I, th I think we need to make a distinction between joint consultation committees in the UK and works councils in the rest of Europe, or most of the rest of Europe. Now, I mean, that really is the key distinction. It explains where the directive is coming from. Joint consultation committees have long existed in the UK, not least because of their significance in the Second World War uh, in productivity. And they continued well after the Second World War, and they still exist in the UK. Um, but the unions have always insisted, first of all, that members on the workers' side should be controlled by the union. And also that there was no room for non-union representatives on joint consultation committees. And this is known as the single union channel, which those of you who are familiar with British uh, industrial relations will be well aware of. Um, basically, if you're not a member of a trade union, then you don't have collective rights to, re to representation. Um, in addition, sometimes unions were fearful that joint consultation committees might get taken over by uh, independent trade, uh, by shop stewards. And they generally wanted to try to avoid that if they then were going to lose their, their dependence. Um, however, unions have generally been quite happy to go along with joint consultation, providing it hasn't gotten the way of collective bargaining, which is their priority. Meanwhile, employers um, are generally or have been generally hostile to joint consultation, not least because they mean sharing power with the unions, but also many employers have feared that joint consultation kind of gradually morphs into collective bargaining, which they want to try and prevent. So but both of them, both employers and unions, have been hostile to legislation, historically hostile to legislation, um, because they both have been part of the voluntaristic tradition of industrial relations in the UK. Um, and I think that helps to explain why the post-war Labour government of Attlee did not legislate for joint consultation in the way that the German and the French governments did immediately in the post-war period. Um, and what this means really is that the UK system stands in very stark contrast to forms of collective representation in the rest of Europe, particularly the role of works councils. We're talking here about works councils, we're not talking about board level representation. And to draw the parallel, I think it's helpful to, to, um, uh, to, to make a parallel with what we could call political citizenship and employment citizenship. Um, we're all used as members of a political democracy to casting our vote every five years at local level, regional level, national level, and those of us still in the European Union at uh, European level. Um, and our elected members of parliament or councillors go along and represent our interests uh, and try to implement a political programme on which they have stood up. I mean, we're all very familiar with that. But it means that we are, if you like, citizens. That's what part of what being a citizen of a country means. Uh, it means having certain political rights within the system. Now, Works councils, I mean, the way I've, I understand works councils is they extend that notion of citizenship to the place of work. Um, they give workers the right to elect works councillors who then represent their interests at the workplace. And these rights are irrespective of, of trade union membership. Um, by the way, I just noticed that Peter Ackers is trying to get in. Shall we admit him? 
Indeed. Um, um, so, um, um, Works Councils represent employees irrespective of trade union membership. I and mean, that, that really is a critical distinction, a very, very important one, a very, very basic point that needs to be made. Um, and that principle really extends through almost all member states of the European Union. Um, have a, having said that, I mean, Works Council themselves, if you look at the legislation, they vary a great deal from one country to another. The actual for, formation and configuration of Works Councils varies a great deal. Um, in some countries, they're based on statute. In other countries, they're based on a collective agreement. Um, company size thresholds vary a great deal. In Germany, a Works Council can be activated in a, a company with only five employees, whereas I think in Luxembourg, it's 150, and there are various thresholds in between that. The number of works councils who may be elected varies a great deal. Um, the composition varies. In some countries, they are employee only panels. In other countries, they include management as part of the actual committee. Um, nomination rights vary. I, I could go on, but the other important point is the information, the consultation, and co determination rights vary a great deal as well. Uh, I think German works councils have quite extensive co determination rights, for example, over areas like. Um, methods of re remuneration, shift patterns, regrading, things like that, which means they actually have a veto over management decisions. And again, that's, that is quite a, um, a, a considerable influence to have at the workplace. Um, so the key point then is that works councils establish in each member state a floor of basic employee rights to information and consultation that establishes you know, what I see as employment citizenship which stands in marked contrast to Ireland and the UK, where collective rights are really restricted to trade union membership. And this is where pressure for the ICE directive came from. It's in this anomalous position of the UK and Ireland. And I think there are two sources, just briefly before I hand over to Aline. The first one was with the European Works Council Directive in 1994, which conferred rights uh, to information consultation on workers in uh, larger multinational companies based in Europe. And uh, these companies uh, were constrained to, to, um, to have a European Works Council, which represented the interests of workers at European level, group European level uh, within these companies. Um, and so what this meant paradoxically was that a UK employee might be working for, say, a French or American South African multinational and have rights to information and consultation at European group level, but not have them at domestic national level in the UK, uh, which, which created a kind of representation gap between European level and domestic level. And that was clearly anomalous uh, and, and something that needed to be um, dealt with by the Commission uh, for the sake of um, uniformity and coherence. Um, and of course, that point also extended to Ireland. And then after 2004, with enlargement, there were other countries as, as well in that position. So, for example, Cyprus and Malta, and I think Bulgaria and Romania were in a similar position to the UK and Ireland. Um, and then secondly, the other point of pressure was that um, the problem was compounded by the gradual adoption of further directives by the Commission covering specific areas of industrial relations where information and consultation was important, so-called contextual directives. And these included areas like the health and safety at work, the framework directive from 1989, the collective redundancies directive in 1998, consolidated transfer of undertakings in 2001, takeover bids in 2004. And it meant, for example, in the case of collective redundancies, you might be a UK worker who had rights through the directive to consultation notification. Um, but how are they to be implemented if you weren't a member of a trade union? That was the key issue. And it meant that the government of the time, that the Conservative government of the time, tied itself in knots by having the election of special employee representatives to represent workers who are threatened by redundancy in those very specific conditions. And it made things very, very complex and extremely anomalous. So the point was that by the late 1990s, it was clear that these anomalies in the UK in relation to the rest of the European um, employment rights was something that really had to be dealt with. And I think that really explains where the ICE directive came from. Um, 
uh, and what the ICE directive does is to <coughs> extend these rights to UK and Irish employees, irrespective of of uh, union membership. So the question then is, 20 years on, as we are now, um, how actually have these regulations actually fared? You know, how are they actually being dealt with in the UK and in Ireland? Um, given the very long standing traditions of single union representation in those countries. Um, so before Brian and Tony uh, look in detail about uh, Ireland and the UK, um, I'm gonna hand over to Eileen who hopefully will explain trading the expectations of the directive at the time and also bring us up to date. So, Aline, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I, I will try to do my best because, of course, um, I was not there uh, at the time we had a heated trade union debates um, uh, regarding the uh, adoption of this general framework directive. Um, but what I can try at least to uh, bring into the debate is um, all the trade union discussion we have and had and have nowadays around information and consultation rights in general and maybe very specifically the transposition of the directive in some countries. Um, I, I really much appreciated, Michael, that you just set the scene by just recalling basic elements. Why are is information and consultation or are information and consultation rights important for trade unions? For us, it's both a matter of indeed extending democracy at the workplace. So democracy does not stop at the factory's gate, as we used to say. Um, and we still very much believe that anyone affected by a decision must be able to take part in its making. So that's this broader general understanding. And that's the reason why information and consultation rights have been recognized and that's long-standing recognition as one of the fundamental rights of the European Union. So that is encoded, um, and that was, I think, first entry in the Charter of Fund Workers' Fundamental Rights from 89, and it's still a very core element of the European social model. For the trade union, when we talk about information and consultation rights, what we have in mind is that is a instrument. And that is an instrument for trade union action, meaning that it is not an end per se, but it is a tool for us to indeed ultimately have a strong bargaining position when we engage discussion and dialogue and collective bargaining with employers. Um, so I. I took note of the fact, Michael, that you said that the employers in the UK were um, initially very reluctant because they thought, oh my God, information and consultation, that's indeed a way to, um, that could extend to collective bargaining. Actually, that is indeed what we have in mind. We want to, as a trade union, we want to have strong information and consultation rights because when you are aware of what's going on in the company, when you have possibility to discuss alternatives with management, then you end up in, in a much stronger bargaining position at the moment you're at the negotiation table. So for us, that's one instrument. And um, what is also important from our trade union perspective is that it is <laughs> one out of the many instruments that exist for democracy at the workplace, and they all go together and are intertwined. Meaning that when we talk, think about Works Council, we also think about Works Council working together and in coordination with shop stewards, with board level employee representation when they exist. Um, and we have in mind that all these systems work together and in good coordination, both at the level of the local plant, the national level and the transnational level. So it's, it's a really is a system um, kind of a jigsaw as we used to, to um, uh, picture it, where you have to have information and consultation as preliminary step for trade union action um, uh, on wages and working condition. Um, I think also that what is important for us when we think about information and consultation rights is because those rights, they also have kind of a specific uh, input, um, and that is a contribution to the system, that is, you have to be informed and consulted also on economic matters, on the industrial or strategic plan of the company. And if when you don't have those collective rights, that obligation does not exist, then you as a trade union would be uh, circumscribed to discussing with management about social aspects that could be wages, working conditions, training, 
But the discussion about the company strategy, the long-term development plan would be out of the scope. So that is, again, the reason why we think it's important. Um, we think it is also important because we think that this is one instrument, both in a proactive approach, uh, information and consultation rights is for workers to be informed and consulted on a regular basis about the situation of the company, the social situation, the situation of employment, and the economic situation. And that helps us to be proactive in getting ready and shaping together with management. And then we are close to co-determination in some cases, because then that's a way for us to be ready to shape the future of the company. So to really be part of, let's discuss what is the future that we want for our company and the jobs therein. But information and consultation rights, um, and that certainly played a major role for the adoption of the directive, are absolutely instrumental in time of restructuring. And this is more the reactive approach that we can have as trade union, meaning that we, well, I mean, in the UK, regrettably, you are kind of used um, to those cases where you just learn overnight by management that workers can be just dismissed and they have, uh, would receive a letter and maybe a week later, they are already um, member um, can go to the employment services uh, because layoff is just there and you have no chance to discuss. And what we want with information and consultation is some kind of guarantee, a minimum guarantee that would apply. And thanks to that directive everywhere, that these kind of firing, forced redundancy, um, uh, last minute announcement of layoff does not exist. And is open for discussion and consultation and information and in-depth assessment and um, um, exchange of views with worker representatives. When the, when indeed, uh, as Michael mentioned, so maybe I don't need to, to put that into context again, but when the European Works Council started to kick off and really be active body, so the EWC directive dates from 1994, really started to be implemented and enforced 1996. And then we started to have experiments in many companies about indeed that transnational level of information and consultation. So transnational level of dialogue. And that's indeed when we realized, okay, but it's so weird that the European management inform and consult on company strategy, but that information and consultation does not cascade down to the national and local level. Because again, for us, the trade unions, the European Works Council are just one instrument to help build a strong bargaining position power of trade unions at the local level. So you need to have all this cascading down to the local level. So definitely that was one of the uh, reason why we pushed for the general framework directive that was eventually adopted in 2002. We were very optimistic at that time that it could help having some degree of harmonization with minimum standard of what information and consultation would mean. We were very optimistic that uh, the convergence of the different system that exist at that time would mean a upward convergence to the highest level possible of, of information consultation rights. Actually, when you read the directive, it's better than one what we feared we could have had uh, as a final directive because um, the employers were absolutely reluctant to have anything adopted. But at least we thought, okay, there are some basic minimum standards that we can work on uh, and that could help us. We were, however, and this is still a very crucial point, uh, puzzled by the role of trade unions in all this. Uh, because indeed, the Works Council, they are not that trade union body. Uh, Non-trade unionist, non-trade union members can be elected as member of the Works Council. Um, so that was one of the big question mark that we had. Bearing in mind, however, that this question mark was not a question mark shared by all trade unions in Europe. You had some trade unions for historical reason that had the position of saying, we trade union will remain out of the company as a controlling body of what the management could do. We don't want to be part of managerial decision-making process. So it's better if we keep that independence. And that is the reason why you had this 
compromise um, uh, adopted in the end of works council that indeed uh, there is no specific role for trade union and trade union representatives therein. We were hopeful as well that this directive could help us uh, securing some resources at least for trade union representatives at local level, those who would become works council members. The uh, directive helps securing that you have paid time off for this uh, mandate, uh, and especially when you have extensive information and consultation procedure, um, and also specific protection against um, discrimination and unfair dismissal. So again, we were kind of optimistic. Back then, it was also a different European Union. Uh, the political atmosphere was a bit different as well. So we were full of hope. And it, the plan did not go as intended. Uh, I think that's what we can say uh, 20 years later. Um, and I'm very sorry that the assessment is um, not that positive and it's not just in Ireland in, and in the UK. Um, um, as Michael mentioned, the directive ultimately applied to all the EU member states. So also to countries that were completely um, uh, aligned to the idea and concept of social dialogue at the workplace. Central Eastern European countries, for instance, um, countries where you had the um, a, a tradition of single channel of worker representation via trade unions, works council was kind of a weird UFO. We just don't really know how it works. Um, in the end, the implementation is pretty poor. Um, if you look at the statistics, you still have a great majority of workplaces in Europe where you have no worker representation whatsoever. I mean, no works council, no, no trade union even. Um, I think now is the case that only one third of workplaces in private sector have some form, form of worker representation. We're talking about one third and we're talking about a directive that is in application for 20 years. So that's a major failure, we believe. Um, also, we have could have seen actually this is one of the problem we have in how to work out together with those works council some of them have been used by management uh, as instrument for trade union busting so you do have works council which are works council composed and made up and set up mm -hmm. by management um, and and suddenly you had an upsurge of yellow not trade union but yellow works council committee um, which is a problem because as they exist, there are, for instance, the one we liaise with when we are in European Works Council procedure for information and consultation. So we are also kind of stuck working with them. What we know also from the implementation in the directive, and again, that is not specific to Ireland and the UK, is that the uh, quality of information is uneven, not to say it's poor, and consultation barely happen. And when it happens, it's not before management make a decision of, let's say, closing a plant. It's after the decision has been made. And then the consultation is not consulting about the decision of closing the plant. It's consulting about the consequences of this decision on workers, which was absolutely not what was initially intended with the, uh, the directive. Uh, so we have this problem of, of this process of consultation coming too late in the decision making process so after the decision has been made and what is specific to some countries and that is uh, the case in in um, the uk nowadays is that the process sometimes um, uh, national legislation in transposing have put a time limit for this information and consultation process the time limit you have in the UK, um, and I'm looking at UK experts, so I'm sure I'm not saying nonsense, uh, but I think you have, depending on the number of people to be laid off, it's either 30 days of information consultation process or 45 days. When you, th when you <clears throat> think about the fact that an information consultation procedure <clears throat> at the level of an EWC for a restructuring can last up to six months, which is something we've seen plenty of time, you can see there is a major discrepancies between EWC consultation procedure of six months and UK information consultation procedure of 45 days. Then, then 
whatever the WC would decide in the end, it will have no effect because in the UK, something will have been made and decided and, and deal struck in 45 days. So we also, um, in the end, lack this um, coordination link. Uh, so that directive did not manage to achieve that. Harmonization is still not there. We still have plenty of different system in different um, countries. We ended up uh, with a um, really fragmented European legal framework on information and consultation. The idea of the 2002 uh, 14 directive was to bring harmonization. Um, we thought at that time that it means that this uh, directive would be a benchmark for any future legislation from the European level that would say, oh, you need information and consultation of workers, please refer to the general framework directive. Actually, it's not the case. So nowadays you have more than 15 different pieces of EU legislation that does refer to information and consultation rights to some extent. And it's not always the same definition of information. It's not always the same definition of consultation. It's not always the same definition of what is the time frame from the for the process. So it really is a patchy um, and inefficient framework nowadays. Another problem we have and we face is talking about today um, that we need those rights. Uh, so we are uh, fighting, and when I say we, it's Industrial Europe, that's also the European Trade Union Confederation. We've been campaigning for more than two years now in a campaign called More Democracy at Work, because what is a major problem we have nowadays is our um, companies, and certainly in the sectors uh, covered by Industrial Europe, let's just think about automotive sector, steel sector, energy sector, they are undergoing massive changes. We're talking here about decarbonization, digitalization, recovering from COVID, um, uh, now the impact uh, of the war in Ukraine. We are not on the verge because it has already started of massive restructuring. The scale of the change, the scale of the impact of a job is unprecedented and the change is going at a pace never seen before. And that is the reason why we keep banging on the door of the European Union and European institutions saying them, if you want to be serious about decarbonizing our society, about digitalization, about us being able to cope with the challenges, we need to have proper information and consultation. And that means very clearly we need to have information in a timely manner. So not once the decision has been made by management, but as early as possible in the stage of the decision-making process. The information has to be of proper quality that is comprehensive, up-to-date, clear, and good enough that we can run a trade union in-depth assessment of the situation of the company and also develop our own potential alternatives to change, to avoid, of course, layoff or plan closure. What we st still don't have, for instance, is a clear right of being able to discuss those alternatives that we can develop together with the real decision makers, because what is also something that the directive failed is making sure we have information and consultation and dialogue with the real decision makers and not just the assistant of the local HR manager, for instance. And of course, we want proper sanction, deterrent sanction in case of breach. The major issue we still have nowadays is we have companies not respecting information and consultation rights and actually not giving a shit about it, uh, not a problem because sanctions are are so miserable that it's still cheaper to not respect your works council than to engage into a full procedure of information and consultation. And that is valid for both for the right of European works council, that is also something we are fighting for, and the right for local works council. So this is still, so we are 20 years after the adoption of that directive, and it is still a very topical issue. That is still something we almost discuss every day, and we believe it's still a, a battle worth fighting for. 
uh, and more than happy to hear about the situation in Ireland and, and, and the UK. So hear from Brian and Tony um, to see how we can best support and what is the kind of trade union action we can also put in place to improve those information and consultation rights. Thank you. And of course, if you have any question, happy to answer. Thank you very much, Aline. That was a, a real tour de force, actually, a, a European level tour de force. Um, I'm sure we're going to come back to you on many of those points. Um, however, to keep things moving, I would like to go on straight to Brian. We'll have a discussion of all three speakers at the end, because I think that's more streamlined. Um, Brian, I think over to you, really, um, if you'd like to tell us about Ireland. OK, thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm very much in favour of group discussions because there's safety in numbers. Um, <laughs> Well, yes, it's much easier. Um, but but that that, that was a, a, a very interesting presentation. Um, I have a, a presentation which I, I I want to see if I can share with you, um, because it says you look at my gloomy hotel room. Um, if I can, for for one moment. Um, it's a bit wordy, but I will try and uh, take you through it. No, well done, Brian. That's fine. That's showing up. You can see that, can you? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, um, just firstly, for anybody who who um, wonders what SIP two is about, and I know you 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 made reference to it in your introduction, but um, it is Ireland's largest trade union. We represent about a third of workers, unionized workers, um, on in 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 Ireland, and. Um, our union is based on the, on the divisional structure, structure. so we have um, divisions in the public sector and divisions in the private sector, health, public administration, community, manufacturing services, and CHOC, which is transport, energy, aviation, and construction. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's how, how we structured the, um, the union, and we would be one of the, the, the leading members of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, which is the Irish Trade Union Confederation. Um, <clears throat> so just, and I, you've covered some of this, Michael, so I won't dwell on it, but um, in terms of the Irish legisl legislative uh, situation, we, we, we do have, um, you know, examples, and Aline had, had referenced the fact that there were, there, there were there was a right to information consultation in, in, in other legislation. So we would have had the Worker Participation Act, which was provided for worker directors in semi-state companies, um, the Works Council's, European Works Council's legislation, uh, and rights under some of the Employment Acts, um, rights to information and consultation around and insolvency and redundancy, um, obviously in, in terms of health and safety, um, and the Data Protection Act. So there's quite a number of, of, of pieces of legislation where there's provision for the right to information and consultation. So again, how we got to the directive, and again, you've covered this, so I, I only dwell brief, uh, briefly dwell on it, but um, there were a number of other directives, so it didn't, it didn't come out of, of, of nowhere. And unfortunately, I'm old enough to not just remember the, the, the ICE directive, but the European Works Council directive um, and, and what, what, what that meant and envisaged. And we certainly felt, um, when, when the ICE directive was being talked about and developed, we certainly felt that it, it, it was, in our view, maybe a, an extension of the sort of structures that, that, that the European Works, uh, the, the, the Worker Directors and the European Works Council's um, directive provided for, but that it would be generally applicable to, 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 to companies that weren't covered by those, those, those situations. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's directives building one, one, one on top of the other. Um, again, I, I, I'm going to skip over that slide because everybody knows what the directive involves. Um, but at the time, um, you know, th there was a lot of debate and a lot of controversy um, around the the, uh, the the transposition of the directive into, into Irish uh, law. Um, and although the um, the directive was 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 brought forward in 2002 it was 2006 before the irish legislation was, was actually in enact, in, enacted um but the employers were concerned and ivec would be the the employers confederation <clears throat> um 
And, and their big concern was it would open the floodgates for, 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 for um, union recognition, that the unions would flood into every company in the land and there'd be shop stewards left, right and centre and they'd, they'd, the poor old employer would be overrun. Um, and what they tried to do was insist that the employee representatives should, should be employees of the company. So you couldn't have your, 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 your trade union officials involved. And the other big issue was... Um, the role of the multinationals and, and Ireland, as, as you probably know, um, would have a, a you know a big um, <clears throat> a, 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 a big dependency on, on US multinational companies. So what the employers were really looking for was um, you know some control on the situation and also that it, it, it wasn't an automatic right that it had to be triggered by a request. Um, the the Chambers of Commerce, the American Chamber of Commerce actually was quite uh, active in terms of lobbying. Um, and their view was that the legislation had to take into account the structure and practices of volunteerism in, in industrial relations in Ireland, um, which I think, um, and Aline referred to this, was part of what the directive was trying to do in, in, in terms of harmonizing um, <clears throat> the, 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 the structures and processes across the European Union. Um, and, and they went on to say the existence of such an approach has added to the attractiveness of Ireland as a location for multinationals. And I'm certainly worried by that statement. Um, and you could only be worried by that. Um, and they, they wanted the legislation to be designed to support that sort of approach. And in other words, they were saying no regulation, please, because we're American. And that's 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 the essence of what they, they were they were looking to do. Um, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, <clears throat> Then suggested, you know, well, really, there's no, there's no need for a heavy duty model here, you know, um, where where employees are happy with direct information and consultation, that should be allowed, um, and certainly the the, the age old chestnut of well, management has the final responsibility to make decisions. Um, <clears throat> you know, the last thing they wanted was to move any any closer to co determination, um, <clears throat> and of course, that some information was just too too confidential to be given to anybody. Um, and, and again, they they, they were of the, of the view that there should be an opt in mechanism, and that that representatives should actually be employees of the organisation to keep the, the trade union officials out. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, the Congress of Trade Unions wanted to see the legislation used as, as a basis for supporting collective representation. And, and the key issue, I think, for, for, for the unions at the time um, was they were afraid that this would dissipate that, that, that single channel of collective rep representation. Um, <clears throat> and, and, and while the employers were worried that the floodgates would open and let you know, trade unions run all over the place, the unions were worried that this would actually dissipate the power of, 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 of the unions, the, the collective representation. Um, <clears throat> so, ironically, it took longer in Ireland to, 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 to transpose the directive simply because the social partners couldn't agree. Um, and, and it's ironic because Ireland would have had a history of social partnership, um, which wouldn't have been, you know, a, 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 a particularly as, as, as strong, say, as in the UK. But in, in, in the UK, the TUC and the CBI managed to conclude an agreement. In, in the Irish case, um, it was the government that ended up just bringing the legislation in. So when it came in, the question was, well, who was happy with it? And clearly the employers were happy with it. Um, the Irish Congress of Trade Unions said, from our point of view, this legislation is of no real value. Um, we're probably now in the most unfavourable position in Europe um, and, and, and a significant opportunity to enhance workplace cooperation has been sacrificed to appease business interests. IBEC, having got what they wanted pretty much, then started to demand flexible implementation and to make sure that the new proposals didn't make management's ability to make management decisions um, any more difficult or, or any more restrictive. So it's really when it came down to it, um, and, and, and I, you, you know from this slide that I was probably watching the Champions League final at that stage. <laughs> But, you know, it was a clear win for the employers over the unions um, in, in, in terms of how the, the, the directive was, was transposed. And I personally see that as one of the weaknesses in terms of the, 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 EU, the EU directives. They, they, they may be great insofar as, 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 as you get them um, agreed at, at, at the European level, but it's then left to the, to, 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 to the various approaches from governments as to how they, they, they transpose the legislation. And that's where it gets lost and weakened in, 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 in the process. 
So <clears throat> I just want to briefly, and, and, and Michael, you can give me a rattle when I'm starting to run out of time, but I, I was looking at this and, and um, I came across a piece of research which was done by a number of people um, uh, in, in Dublin City University, Queen's University, the University of uh, Birmingham, uh, University of Limerick and the University of South Australia. And what they looked at wasn't so much as to how, how employers um, were, were, were utilising the regulations because in, in effect, a lot of the employers weren't, but they looked at how employers were actually trying to, 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 to make sure that they didn't comply. Um, and they, they based it on three approaches. One was avoidance, one was suppression, and one was ne neglect. Um, and there were three case studies, which I'm, 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 I'm going to go through very quickly uh, because of the time constraints. <clears throat> um, but there were a number of companies, in, one in the catering area, one in manufacturing, and one in construction. Large numbers over quite a lot of sites in some cases, but you know, these were big organizations. Um, <clears throat> and in the first case, the, the catering company, um, this was an example of, of, of um, <clears throat> you know, where, where, where the company wanted to avoid the whole, the whole issue, the whole situation, because they had been nervous about the, 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 the intent of the regulations. Um, <clears throat> they had a, a view that, that information and consultation should be exclusively management de determined and, and, and a controlled structure. There was no real structure or process in place for collective uh, employee voice. In some of the sites, there was unofficial union rec represent representative re recognised, but shop stewards couldn't circulate material and any meetings took place off site. Um, and one of the things was because it, 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 it was part of an American uh, multinational, the, the Irish management didn't tell the Americans um, about this legislation because they were afraid that it would alarm uh, headquarters and it would only bring them over to, to get involved in the running of the Irish operation. And that's quite common in, 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 in Irish um, parts of, 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 of uh, American multinationals. They like to keep the American multinationals in America and they like to run the operation here without, without telling them too much. Um, and that was very much the case with this company. So they adopted the wait and see approach. Um, and when the legislation came, they were quite happy because they didn't see that it posed them uh, any any difficulty or or, 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 or or any threat or challenge to the way they were operating. Um, <clears throat> so they they took a view that they would continue with their own management determined structures and processes unless they were challenged. And one of the things was in the absence of, of any meaningful regulatory oversight, there was no real risk to them. They could just keep going. And, and, and nobody was really going to say anything about it unless somebody started to, 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 to challenge that. Now, there was, um, um, there, there was some union organising going on in, in, in that sector. Um, the interesting thing was that, aside from one shop, Stuart, and, and, and there was very little interest in, 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 in the whole thing. And the full-time union official um had no interest in in the directive at all and therefore the employer was entirely free to do whatever they wanted um <clears throat> so it it's it, it it was an example where because nobody really was exercised about it the company could just avoid it and there were no consequences for them in the second case study it's 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 somewhat different because the manufacturing company took a view that they were just going to suppress this um and and and, and they took that view in response to, to a request that was triggered under, under the di directive. Um, now, now, this company was very much involved in top-down communication on a one-to-one, -one, the individual one-to-one -one basis. And, you know, it, it, was, it was a lot of sort of one-to-one -one meetings with, with, with supervisors. So there was no real collective st structure. Um, the trigger request in this case was advanced via the Labour Court. Um, and the labor, court, the labor court contacted the employer. The employer responded by firstly claiming that it had already set up uh, a forum. In other words, that it, 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 it had a, a previous agreement. And uh, <clears throat> the, after the, 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 the labor court had contacted them, um, <clears throat> the company suddenly put up uh, details on, on their intranet uh, of, of the forum and claimed that it had been established in 2006. A week later, it claimed that it had been established in 2004. Uh, it then followed uh, that with a revised version of the constitution, which removed the date 
of its establishment altogether. Um, <clears throat> and later on, um, the employer confirmed that they couldn't find a signed or dated copy uh, of the ledge PEA, but argued that that didn't, approve, that didn't disprove the fact that they, they, they actually had one just because they couldn't find it, didn't mean they didn't have one. Um, and effectively what the employer in this case did was they just ignored requests to initiate negotiations. They presented their forum as a fait accompli um, <clears throat> and they appointed rather than elected um, representatives to it. Um, so they, 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 they took a fairly proactive uh, uh, approach to resisting this. So having attempted in the first case, you know, to obfuscate, um, they then decided just to turn to, 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 turn to a reliance on, on steamrolling through um, what, what, what their preferred course was. Um, they did employ, uh, appoint two of the employees who had been involved in requesting um, the, 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 the compliance with the, with the forum, but they obstructed the forum meeting because they argued that, that the forum wasn't compliant with, with the regulations. Um, and they contended that the, the, the period of three months for negotiating had elapsed. Uh, and that the standard rules should apply. And the company's response to that was to suspend the forum um, and hold a plant-wide refer referendum to settle the matter. Um, but the thing was, the, refer the referendum process was reported by activists to be highly tainted by employer threats that if the standard rules were adopted, the American owner's investment in the plant would suffer. So if you want the regulations, you lose your job, and that's your choice, so which are you going to vote for? And uh, of course, the, the, the outcome of that was, was, was always, always going to be fairly obvious. Um, <clears throat> there was no formal declaration of the referendum results um, <clears throat> and attempts to, to, to get the results of the voting uh, were unsuccessful. Um, the thing was that, you know, this, this, this was, this, 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 was um, this was a situation where the company just stonewalled the, 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 the request. They resisted it. And at the end of all of this, um, 12 months after the initial uh, request, the company dismissed two employees. They just got rid of them. Um, and when they got rid of the employees, that ended the whole, the whole the, 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 the campaign for, for regulatory, the regulatory compliance. So that's, you know, I suppose just shows um, you know, it's, it's an example of, 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 of where there was a very active resistance um, to cooperating with, with, with a European directive. The third case um, was one, the construction company, they were aware of the directive, but they were a bit skeptical about its value. Um, and when the legislation was brought into, into force, um, they, 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 they weren't particularly bothered about it. They felt, well, look, we have our own appropriate structures and processes in place. And sure, we, we can just regard those as pre-existing agreements. Um, and that's the approach that they took to it. Um, <clears throat> they, they, they did acknowledge that apart from health and safety, and obviously that would be a huge issue around construction, um, the consultation wasn't necessarily well developed. Um, <clears throat> they did argue that each site was autonomous uh, in terms of information sharing and workplace dialogue. And so basically they said, well, it's up to each site to adopt its own uh, process on information disclosure. Um, <clears throat> But the structures were unilaterally determined by management. They weren't formally agreed with workforce representatives, and they were ultimately dependent on, on the local manager um, and, and what he, you know, and it probably was he in most almost all cases, um, decided they, they, they wanted to do. Um, there were some, some works committees, but there were forums that particularly um, uh, looked at addressing content of production and operational matters. Um, <clears throat> And you know, while they had health and safety committees, um, the employee representative was nearly always the employee, the appointed health and safety officer. So they weren't really uh, an employee representative. Um, and <clears throat> dialogue on content like financial circumstances or employment developments or contractual matters was non-existent, particularly in any of the non the non-union sites. Um, <clears throat> so the thing is. You know, even in the unionist in, in, in the union unionized sites, um, <clears throat> the unions didn't really show any inclination to use the INC regulations uh, to, to to affect changes, um, <clears throat> and that attitude, uh, you know, I, I, it allowed the company <clears throat> um, to 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 basically just 
let the, the whole issue die of neglect, because again, nobody was really interested in it. Um, and, and, and the thing with those case studies is that they were active approaches or, or inactive approaches, but, but nonetheless active strategies by employers uh, in, in, in terms of how they would deal with the, the, uh, the, 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 the legislation in Ireland. So in terms of how effective the um, uh, directive has been, um, one of the things is, 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 is um, the EGUI um, in, in, in 2021, um, they, 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 um, <clears throat> they said that, um, you know, the, 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 it, it doesn't seem to have had um, a, a, a meaningful or a major impact. Um, the Irish legislation didn't require companies um, to, covered by it to establish the bodies. It had to be on the basis of, 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 of a request. Um, and they also pointed out that the Eurofound found, um, 2013 um, European co company survey um, showed that um, the 28% the, the of establishments in Ireland had some form of official employee representation, but that, that was actually below the average of 32%. So I think the point there was that, you know, it didn't, it didn't look like the, the, um, the, the, the legislation really had any effect uh, from that point of view. In, in terms of um, the view within SIP2, um, you know, I got a number of comments from people when I, when I went talking to them. Um, and, you know, there were, I, I just listed some of them here. One person said the only one I was aware of was Tesco, but that was before the legislation and that doesn't function anymore. Um, and the view was that there were a number of employee forums, but they tended to be in, 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 in organizations um, who were trying to keep the union out or where there was, there was a partial membership um, and, and where the employer just didn't want to engage with the union for collective bargaining purposes. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think that the view of the, 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 our own union was that it, 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 didn't, it didn't, hadn't really achieved what, what had been intended. Attended. Um, and it's clear that the unions haven't embraced the legislation, to be fair, you know, that needs to be said, I think. Uh, but that's not surprising, given the interview and the legislation was brought forward. Um, employers don't want the structures. And if they do, it's, it's most likely because they're adopting a union avoidance or a resistance strategy. Governments seem to have legislated in fear of the American multinationals. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 I suppose that's understandable, given the level of investment. One of the other things I looked at in, in, in terms of this question was, well, you know, so since 2006, how many cases have been taken uh, through, through the Labour Court and the, and the adjudication service? And, and it was quite interesting, the, the, the results. Um, in terms of adjudication cases, um, there have been seven uh, since 2006. Um, and as you can see there, they've either all been lost uh, or withdrawn or the claimant didn't turn up. Um, so that's it um, since uh, the, 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 the legislation was brought forward in 2006, seven cases. In terms of the Labour Court, there were six cases uh, and five of those six um, failed um, and one of them was successful. Um, interestingly enough, it was one brought, brought, brought by the trade unions because most of the other cases weren't. Um, they were either brought by individuals or brought by uh, solicitors. Um, and I've, I've just listed there the outcome. It's just the, the, the end of the Labour Court recommendation, because I think it's interest, interesting to note. They say, having regard to all the circumstances of this case, the court must conclude the union's complaint is well founded. Uh, and that the HSE, which is the employer, the health service executive in Ireland, contravened the agreement by its failure to inform or consult with the unions. The court recommends the HSE should assure the unions that should the need for a similar initiative arise in the future, there'll be full and adequate consultation. But really, we don't consider that it's appropriate to make any other recommendations. So on the one case that was won, the court said, yeah, look, you know, you shouldn't have done it. Um, but really, that, that's about as far as it goes. No penalties, no fines, no nothing. And that's, you know, maybe says something about um, the legislation and, 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 and how it's fared out since. Um, in terms of some suggestions, I definitely think we need to move away from a requirement for the workers for workers to trigger um, the mechanism. <clears throat> that's that's you know, if you look at health and safety legislation, if you if you look at other forms of legislation, the, the requirement isn't for workers to trigger, trigger the mechanism. The employer has to actually do things. 
um, and there needs to be some sort of mandatory statutory requirement for employers to provide <clears throat> information and consultation. There needs to be some independent and regulatory oversight just to, to, to make sure that forums aren't simply, you know, stuffed by management, that they are actually meaningful bodies um, <clears throat> and that, uh, oh, sorry, um, that um, the, 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 there's a... Um, a provision to, to for, for, for a right to training and access to expert services as there would be with European works councils um, and you know an acknowledgement that um, there should be some union input into the design of the structure uh, where the company is unionized um, that's it um, so thanks very much and uh, if you have any questions wait until I have other people with me and they might be able to answer them for me thank you Uh, many thanks, Brian. Um, again, that was a, a really great performance, um, extremely comprehensive, and I'm sure, again, I've got loads of questions, I'm sure many others will too, um, but we'll come back to them um, after we've heard from Tony. Tony, I think it's up to you now. Yeah, thank, you thanks very much, Michael, and okay. I found the contributions fantastic. Um, certainly uh, from my comrade Aileen uh, on how the problems in in Europe uh, and also from Brian. What Brian's just giving you a report on is very much uh, reflected about what happened in the UK. I just want to, what I think is best to do is concentrate on what actually happened and why the union that I was Deputy General Secretary of the Graphical Paper and Media Union embraced the ICE regulations and how we got off the ground on them, why we thought it was important, and then also contrast that as to what actually happened in the TUC and the British Trade Union movement and where we go from here. Overall, I would head this a missed opportunity um, because it was at the time something that the union I came from, the GPMU, um, second nature. Uh, those of you who know anything about the history of trade unions in the printing industry will know there was a high level of membership, a high level of collective bargaining, either at local level and at national level, uh, and also a high level of involvement with employers uh, at national level and at local level as well. Why did we back it? Well, two reasons. One is we had a fair amount of experience, or we developed a fair amount of experience about what went on in Europe. Um, the GPMU was uh, a major affiliate of, of the uh, uh, International Graphical Federation, which eventually became uni. Uh, and we had good relationships with unions in Scandinavia, but in particular, the uh, union in Germany, IG Media, who we were involved in a series of bilateral training and uh, information uh, uh, um, exchanges uh, with shop stewards and local reps and full-time officials becoming involved and it dawned on many of us in the GPM that the German system of co-determination which was something that we could perhaps begin to have a look at. So we had, like Brian has said, we had some uh, uh, good relationships with employers through European works councils and when the ICE regulations came on board, uh, came out uh, after um, uh, a lot of problems, we took, we took the view that it was better to embrace it and get on board with it and use it to our own advantage. Uh, now, that proved more difficult than, uh, than uh, we thought. But nonetheless, I can say that two important things happened. One is we were blindsided by Yellow Pages, the telephone directory. You remember them? Um, they kept fire doors open in factories and things of that nature. Uh, Yellow Pages, uh, we had collective bargaining with that company, but only for artists and designers. The vast majority of workers were sales reps, uh, administration staff, uh, and various other people. But we had a good relationship with them. And their HR phoned me up and said to me one day, can we have a quick word with you? Oh, this new legislation's coming in. And we didn't know that much about it, but it showed some interest. 
before we could do too much about it, because we only represented small pockets of members who worked in art studios inside three or four of their sites, the company had put together a, a, a pre-deal. Uh, they put it on the internet. Uh, they balloted the members on the internet. Uh, they'd done everything uh, to set the whole thing up. Um, we tried to put um, uh, uh, skids under it by um, getting our union reps uh, to jump up and down. But at the end of the day, the company won it by North Korean uh, 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 numbers. Massive. Because basically people just pressed the button and said, yeah, we'll go with that. When it came to selecting the committee, we did try to put up um, union reps uh, to get on there. But again, it had all been stitched up. Now, we could have been very angry with them, but we recognised our job was to try to build a union membership in Yellow Pages, and it was restricted to artists and designers. And because we hadn't built membership among sales staff and sales reps and, and all sorts of other people, we were in a weak position. But the second thing that happened on ICE uh, in terms of the union was Macmillan. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd been organising at Macmillan, a big publishing company, for some time. And a number of members in a, where, in a warehouse in Macmillan had joined the union. And the company had done everything it could, like it would normally, to try and keep us out. And we used the ICE regulations. And I thought, having been on the CUC General Council when it was all agreed that this was going to be a, a good opportunity to recruit and organise, this was one way to go. We'd already um, had a good structure in the union in terms of uh, setting up uh, uh, claims for recognition under the legislation. Uh, we had a department uh, with staff in there who knew what to do, who knew all the pitfalls, so we thought we'd be okay. It was only when uh, we decided to do it ourselves and recognise that what we had to do, the union couldn't do it. We had to get an individual or a group of individuals to pr progress the request for information and consultation as a start. And we did that. And we got willing volunteers to be able to do it. And the people who did it did a good job in front of the CAC. We had to employ lawyers to do it for us. They had to give us a lot of advice and support, as well as our, our um, uh, senior member of staff, John Hayward. Some of you know him, uh, who, who handled it all the way through. Why was it important? Well, we won it. I mean, the company um, put up the worst case possible. I have never seen a, a multinational corporation um, perform like it. They put up very junior HR people. They thought it was a joke. They hadn't got preparation done. Um, and our uh, union members who gave evidence on the part of the union to the CAC were great. They did a fantastic job. And the company actually made a complete pig's ear of it. What it did, it gave us an opportunity to get INC. Uh, and then from there, we got formal recognition. So that was very, very important. We'd been used to European Works Councils a little bit. We'd been used to control. There was very, very few company um, works committees. Some had, one or two places had them. Uh, but they were where we weren't particularly strong and the company had set up a works committee of some uh, format and tried to claim that that was a base. In the end, um, we, we established a policy that every national officer with a, within their own cluster of companies and industries were responsible for securing information and consultation agreements with the companies. As you would expect, they went for the ones that they had good relationships with, and it wasn't going to be the biggest problem in the world. Um, and I did a number of them myself. And to be perfectly honest with you, we got together a negotiating body consisting of uh, fathers of the chapels, mothers of the chapels. The meetings usually took a, a, a day or so. A deal was done, and the companies set up ICE committees and used them very well. Some of the companies have now closed because of the technology in the industry, but certainly um, Polestar, which is a big magazine printer, were all right. The Mirror were okay. 
uh, crown packaging, which some of you know as Metal Box, uh, which was multi-union, um, we were able to get um, fairly decent deals. And, and in fairness, the companies worked um, quite well with us. Uh, there were others that we secured. It was hard work getting some of the union reps to think that this was vitally important. Some actually saw it as being very important, particularly when they got the opportunity to talk to the senior management and able to have a discussion and an argument with them. So that's how we came about it. I think at the end, not at the end, but at the point at which we began to taper off, I think we had something like 35, 36 um, agreements uh, with companies and um, we did okay. GPMU merged with Amicus, um, which was a, a manufacturing union um, and didn't have a real problem uh, in as much as Amicus was sort of okay with it. They were part of the, uh, uh, in the European Works Councils, et cetera. It was not the biggest problem in the world. But at the end of the day, the impetus had got taken out. Um, officers were given other duties to look at as people left and we didn't replace. So it became quite, um, quite difficult. TUC. I was a member of the General Council and the Executive Committee of the TUC. And I can well recall a day, a way day meeting where there was a full explanation of how this ICE would work. Um, and the TUC uh, officers and staff said, this gives us an opportunity to build trade unionism in every company in the UK uh, over a certain size. And I thought, yep, yeah, good idea, something we should, uh, we should go for. And the TUC decided to take the show on the road, do regional meetings. And again, I thought that was a, a good idea. I was quite supportive. I was part of the General Council um, uh, members who went to the signing off the deal in Downing Street with Tony Blair uh, and listened to the last vestiges of a horror from employers. One in particular who said, and I took grave exception and said it to him uh, bluntly, what I thought of his comments, was that if we have workers uh, involved in, and we're having to divulge this information, then some of the shop stewards and union reps in the unions will divulge the information to the stock exchange and make money out of it themselves. Absolute ludicrous uh, uh, for a comment to be made like that. And I'm, I made the point that this was a ludicrous point of view. And I think Blair, probably for the first time ever, agreed with the trade unions about something. It was a long, difficult negotiation with the employers to get the deal, but we got there. Um, and some were OK, some were difficult. In the GPMU, we had a number of national collective agreements and we transposed information and consultation into the national agreement in the commercial printing industry, in the papermaking industry, in the packaging industry, and in the, with the Scottish employers. We just transposed the implementation of INC into the national agreement so it was ready-made. It was off the shelf. The problem was it was extremely complex for an individual to start the ball rolling and then use full-time officials to be able to do it as well. And so one of the problems was when the TUC took the show on the road, um, I went to a, a number of the meetings and I certainly remember one in particular where some of the stewards were absolutely horrified. Um, do you mean that we have to sit down with non-union people? Yes. Oh, well, we're not doing that. Um, does it mean that we have to uh, have signed confidentiality uh, arrangements? Yes. Oh, we're not going to do that. Um, these are nothing more than company-based unions, all sorts of stuff. The difficulty was the trade unions with low levels of membership were vulnerable. And I remember people from other unions, no names, no pat drill, saying these would be stacked out by employee uh, place persons. Uh, people would get on who knew nothing about it. They'd be there just to go for the lunch and, and whatever. And there was real cynicism towards it. 
One of the things I can say is we did get some non-union people on some of the um, committees that we set up, primarily because, of course, you had to cover the whole of the workforce. So you would uh, always have to cover um, administration and sales staff. And they got their own slot. And it was never a problem for us, uh, Chair, because what uh, we did and our officers who were involved basically got those people to join the union, gave them a union application form, gave them all the, the, the information. I remember at one where the non-union people complained bitterly to the management that the union people were properly trained. They all had um, folders, pens, uh, union uh, polo shirts, everything. And we didn't have a real problem in signing people up because they thought, well, this is the opportunity I've been waiting to get in the union in any event. So we had those agreements. The TUC went on tour. And then basically, uh, I thought what I thought we could exploit, I've got to say, um, trade unions, there was one or two, but mainly unions and not being critical, they had other things to do. There wasn't a massive interest uh, from uh, from uh, the stewards and the members. There was great skepticism uh, of it. Um, I don't think we grasped it overall. I think it was a missed opportunity because it was complex. It still is. As Brian said in Ireland, it, 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 it takes some sorting out to get the whole thing moving. You do need staff. Uh, who, who can who can run the whole thing? It can be manipulated by employers, uh, and um, we know full well um, that, quite frankly, if there's no real grassroots support for this and what it actually does, it's very difficult to convince your own members. Coming bang up to date, chair. Of course, the biggest circumnavigation of legislation has been PO ferries where, as we know, 800 people were, uh, as Aileen said, you know, dismissed within so many weeks. This was overnight. This was gone. Uh, and the whole thing has proved to be um, disgraceful. And with the company, I don't need to go through it, basically saying it didn't really make any difference what you did or what the unions did. The savings and the profits we would make have been miles more than you would have got in terms of redundancy or any fines for failing to inform and consult. Finally, the ones that I was involved in directly, and I, I was, I did attend them as an expert, um, they worked reasonably okay. We had good uh, union reps who knew how to handle themselves, and eventually you could just let them get on with it, and they weren't too bad. But as Brian has said, once somebody goes, one of your key stewards who was quite keen goes or retires or leaves there's very few people wanting to come behind that happens uh, and again and finally 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 the labor party um i am of the view that everything we say about inc and every people say oh yeah we should do it it is not on their priority list um it's taking us a lot of effort to make sure that the new deal for workers which was agreed at the conference uh, last year uh, stays. Uh, the leader of the party says, yes, we'll implement the whole lot with inside 100 days, fine. Uh, we've also now got the, a massive problem of fire and rehire and fire and replace, because that's what's happened at p &O. So I'm not so sure at the moment, and to sound negative, sorry to say it, I think it's not necessarily um, high on the agenda of the Labour Party, um, it's difficult to keep pushing for the New Deal for Workers, which we will continue to do, and I'll continue to do, and the ending of fire and, um, re not only fire and rehire, but fire and replace. And the p &O deal just swept away anything there. And when um, Aileen, my good comrade from Industrial Europe, says we can do all we can to help, unions in Great Britain and Ireland will. Yeah, but I mean, it'd be very, very difficult at the moment because there's so many things on, on people's minds. So <clears throat> sorry to be negative. I'm usually quite optimistic, but 
I have to be truthful. It's it's legislation that is far too, as Brian said, far too complex to start off with. It should be, if you're going to do it, it's got to be triggered and made much easier. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, again, a very helpful discussion uh, point, I think. Um, we've had three really excellent presentations here from our speakers. Uh, I, I can think of, I've got loads of questions, but I'm, I'm going to restrain myself. Um, how about the rest of you? I, I'm, you you're, I hope somebody will come forward with a, a question, um, a comment. Oh, Sarah, didn't see you up there in the corner. <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Thank you very much, Michael. And good evening, everyone. Um, I should probably confess straight away that I am I was the lead official at the TUC who had to deal with the wretched transposition proceedings, uh, the agonising discussions with the government and the employers uh, and the consequent rolling out of Tony's Roadshow, which he and I spent many happy hours together uh, on. I just a couple of observations um, and I think sort of possible questions to the speakers, all of whom I thought were absolutely excellent, by the way. Um, I think, first of all, the problem in the UK was very much that the, the then Labour government modelled what they wanted uh, from the INC transposition on the statutory recognition uh, legislation, which from their point of view had been a big success because uh, it had been relatively difficult for unions to storm in and get recognition rights. It was much more like the US system than any of the comparable uh, EU systems. And in particular, it had two features, which have already been uh, referred to by each of the speakers, actually. Um, but the first of which was that there was a small firms exclusion uh, in the recognition legislation, which also came into the UK transposition of the EU directive. And that meant that companies could disaggregate in order to, you know, to get themselves mm -hmm. away from the whole uh, implication of the, reg of the, uh, the legislation. Uh, and the second was, as again, particularly Brian was really eloquent on this, was this whole bu business of having a trigger um, and not an automatic right. So employers just managed to manipulate the situation. In fact, in the UK, it was worse than just having a trigger. There was a threshold as well. So it couldn't just be an employer pulling the employee, pulling the trigger. You had to get up to a percentage of proven membership support, exactly as with the statutory recognition scheme, before you could even start off the ICE proceedings. So... I have to say I share, unfortunately, I'm an optimistic person by nature, but I share Tony's, um, should we call it cynicism possibly, uh, or certainly, yeah, it is pessimism about whether these regulations in the UK could ever really deliver anything now in terms of growing the union membership, improving collective relations with employers. And one thing to bear in mind, of course, is that the, the, the ravings of Jacob Rees-Mogg at the moment um, include, I think, introducing sunset clauses now into all uh, trans transposed EU legislation that's still on the UK statute book. And they're desperately looking for low hanging fruit now in order yeah. to try and resurrect the Brexit politics so they can attempt to restate uh, their, you know, their views on all that and try and claw back some popularity with the electorate, which I suspect is going to be a failure. But back onto the, um, just quickly onto the, the, the transposition of the ICE regulations. I think the other big single failure of the TUC, and I'm not taking personal responsibility for this, it was collective responsibility, was that we never succeeded in getting a single channel. And I can understand why the unions were fearful about this, because there was nothing in there that protected existing collective bargaining rights. So what we argued in the negotiations at the TUC, as Tony will remember, is that where a union was recognised, the ICE arrangements would just be the icing on the cake. They would just be... Um, become part of that you wouldn't have to go through the trigger and all that other stuff they just the cbi wouldn't have any of that uh, and therefore nor would uh, the government so i think in future is is there anything we can claw out of all this i i am cynical as i say but i think you would have to do exactly what again what brian was suggesting and have some fairly major reforms of the legislation but i fear it's going to be taken off the statute book in the uk now it can be you know we're not in the eu we don't have to have it there at all um and i i like tony feel that this may just be a busted flush i think there are other things that the unions can do to improve membership levels to campaign for recognition and absolutely ultimately sorry i'm going on much too long to get labor into a position where even if it's not interested in this as such it accepts the principle of a collective employee voice across companies. Um, and that's a slightly separate battle. So 
again, I'm sorry to be skeptical, but I, I very much go along with, with Tony on that. But it's been a fantastic discussion. It's really tripped down memory lane for me. So thanks very much indeed for, for putting it on. It's been very interesting. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, before I call on David, who's also got his hand up, uh, would one, any of the three speakers like to comment on anything that Sarah has said? I, I think you're making comments rather than asking questions, but nevertheless, one can comment on comments, I think, if you want to. Otherwise, I'll, I'll ask David to make his point. Uh, I, no, uh, I, I'm not getting anything from the speakers, David. Thanks, so Michael. Um... For those of you who don't know me, and there will be some of you on the call who don't, um, I, like Sarah, was very active in the development of the information and consultation regulations, although from the employer's perspective, because at the time I was head of employment policy at EF, now Make uh, UK. I have to say um, that unlike probably the CBI from memory, the EF was much more uh, favourably disposed towards the regulations. And I remember on many occasions trying to encourage our members to take a more positive action on this uh, and to see us as an opportunity um, to improve the arrangements for uh, improving and consulting their employees. Um, I have to say that they're always, I always felt, and I think Sarah, who I've sat on many panels with on this particular issue, will have heard me say this before. Um, I used to think that the outcome of the regulations were either going to be that they would be used by employers to marginalise trade unions, which seems to be very much what has happened in Ireland, or used by trade unions to widen the opportunity to demonstrate their ability to represent their members to non-unionized employees. And I have to say, I thought that, that actually the trade union would win the day on this. And I was, how wrong I was on that, because with the honorable exception of Tony uh, and Sarah, there were very few people within the trade union movement who were seriously interested in these regulations. I remember having conversations with a number of trade union representatives uh, and officials over the, uh, at the time. Uh, and I remember one of them saying to me, well, INC is for wimps uh, and being extremely reluctant to sit down with non-trade union representatives and not appreciating that employers did not want to have two separate forums to have information and consultation. If they wanted to have a forum for it, they wanted to have one forum for information and consultation and to talk to everybody uh, or the representatives of everybody about that. Uh, one issue that no one has mentioned before, and particularly as far as the UK is concerned, and I think was something that was problematic was that if my memory serves me right at the time the legislation was about to come into force in the uk um, it was just about the start of a period of purdo before a general election which meant that the government and particularly the government minister uh, involved if my memory serves me right was jerry sutcliffe was unable to do the sort of communications exercise with employers and trade unions that he that we had as we had talked about and that all and and therefore the whole thing was introduced in a vacuum almost and frankly nobody noticed about it unless you talk to you know unless people like myself or sarah were talking to people frankly most people had no idea what you were talking about as far as the INC regulations are concerned in terms of where we are today, I think one has to be absolutely honest and realistic that there isn't any chance that the present administration is going to make any changes to the current legislation that will uh, improve them in any way. And my view would be that it's a shame that there aren't more people like Tony who saw, quite honestly, the, realist, the real opportunity that this gave 
to their members and could make use of the regulations you know, on a concerted basis. I think if the TUC really got their act together and the trade union movement, they could make a serious uh, intention, could a serious uh, in involvement in this. But unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any great appetite within this, within either the TUC or any of the TU uh, trade unions that I can see of, to do it. Right. Thank you, David. Um, any comments from either Tony, Aline, or from Brian? Yeah, can Please. I just make make a point there that Please, on, yeah. on David's comment? I mean, Please. this just was, this was uh, the GPMU had a particular reason because of our levels of membership and strength and deep involvement in inside the uh, industry. Um, and it wasn't just a one-off person. I mean, the whole of our executive council of the union, um, our general secretary at the time, Tony Dubbins, was a, an enthusiast for it. Um, and so were our national officers. And that's why we drove it as hard as we possibly could. Uh, as I say, I think that we could be so pessimistic about it. Um, I just think at the moment, Trade unions have got other fish to fry. And having gone back and rethought about all the things that we've been been through, there are a number of things that we need to do. And, you know, that the, the, the trigger mechanism uh, and all the other things just don't make it easy. They were done. I mean, no, let's not kid ourselves. They transposed the uh, CAC procedure for recognition into the ice. And it, that's hard work. Um, in doing that, you have to have a... You have to be on the ball all the time. So, I mean, I'm not saying it can never come back. I'm saying that there needs to be a case made for Labour in particular to say, yes, we can do it and, and why we need to do it. And, you know, after P&O, uh, after some of the other horror stories and perhaps more, they might be a little bit more attuned to know, to what we need to do. Oh, thanks, Tony. Um, John, I'll take you next. I know Aline's got a hand up, but uh, John, if you'd like to ask your question or make a comment, maybe Aline can reply to that as well. Uh, unmute. You, you need to unmute, John. John, you need to unmute. Yes, I know. It's, oh, uh, all right, sorry. It depends on how many times you have to press the button before it unmutes. But anyway, yeah. if you're in difficulties like this, one of the good suggestions is let's just wind back to points of principle and i think all of the speakers refer to this in some way if people at work are said to have a right to work in healthy circumstances and safely surely it's reasonable to say they should also know what's going on in their company and have a right at least to have a comment on that. So this should be one of the uh, bedrock principles of industrial relations. Uh, Michael, you mentioned right at the end, it is in some senses an extension of the democracy. I put it differently. It is part of an essential democratic company. So yeah. if you start talking that way, the idea of triggers or the mm. ideas of applications or thresholds and so on just disappear whether you work for a big company or a small company whether you are one of the ones who have got taken it seriously or not you've all got the right just as you have the right not to be run over by a forklift truck so that's the principle you start from and and um uh, tony has made the point we need to be making the case I would have thought we made the case not for the ICE regulations, but for the principle that the ICE regulations was going to help us to achieve. So that's the first point I wanted to make. And it seems to me that that point hasn't been made strongly enough with the Labour Party or with employers frankly david although you are more receptive to that argument than i know many employers i've met are there's a compliment buried there somewhere 
Um, the second point I wanted to make was that if we're going to uh, pursue this, then surely we need to clear the decks a bit, because as everybody has said, this whole area is bedeviled by fears, suspicions, myths, and so on. I'm just going to ask a question of fact. Has any research been done which demonstrated the extent to which, in places where there is union recognition, the introduction of non-union people onto representative uh, committees has actually, in real life, weakened the trade union? This is a constant fear. I had that constant fear for 20 or 30 years. I never saw my, many examples of it happening. I just wonder whether anybody has or whether that's something we could say, well, yeah, theoretically it's a problem, but practically it isn't. So let's move on. OK, well, I've spoken long enough. Principle, but also let's clear some of the myths and suspicions out of the way and try and see policy a bit more clearly. Thanks. Thank you, John. Um, Aline. Yeah, um, well, that's a really interesting discussion um, um, because I, I have the feeling that we have to go back to the fundamentals um, element of, of the discussion. John, you referred again to the fact that, Jesus Christ, we are just talking about democracy at the workplace. Um, how come the, the interest is so limited uh, for, for those information and consultation rights? My point being that I, I was listening to you and I'm really, I'm concerned. Um, well, of course, I'm, I'm not old enough to was active at the time when the uh, directive was discussed, but I've been long enough working in the Brussels bubble of a European trade union uh, movement to, to share with you that it's not just the Labour Party having a limited interest. Um, it's it's almost all sides. And I have to admit also internally within the trade union movement, um, as Tony mentioned, there, the house is burning like from everywhere. Uh, the challenges are massive. You guys, you had Brexit on top of everything mm -hmm. to manage. Um, and in the course of the events, um, the, the, the thinking about the instrument you need to cope with the change, uh, to uh, anticipate the change in companies, to cushion the effect on workers, to I mean, the, the discussion about the instrument, and again, that's um, the rights to trade union, of trade unions, the right of collective bargaining, but also the rights for information and consultation, they've been lost in the process. If you look at the discussion at the, uh, Bros in the Brussels bubble, um, actually you have had no new European directive granting new rights for information, consultation or participation since 2005. That was a cross-border merger directive. Since then, nothing new, meaning that since then, mm -hmm. every European directive, when they mention information and consultation, they refer to existing directive. There have been no nothing new big element, uh, or maybe sometimes they try to fix the loopholes in some directive, as was the case for the directive on European Works Council that was recasted in 2009. But apart from that, nothing new. What is... Um, and this is still a, a, a surprise to me because, again, I, I'm, I'm share John's view. We are talking about democracy at the workplace. It, it can't be something we just overlook because there are other emergencies. And yet, this is something we do. But also, from the um, on the side of European policymakers, um, you might have heard about the European pillar of social rights that was supposed to be the silver bullet delivering. Finally, all those rights workers were demanding for decades um, in this big uh, machine that is called European Pillar of Social Rights. You have different chapters regarding individual and collective rights. And one of the chapters in, is giving wor workers voice, uh, in uh, particularly in time of restructuring. Um, and there, so we're talking about something that was already adopted years ago. Huh? And there you had a chapter, we, we want, we, the European Commission and the European Union, we commit uh, to come up with proposal to threaten rights for information, consultation, dialogue, and involvement of workers in decision makings. We will make proposal for new rights, additional rights, and strengthening. 
that was already more than five years ago. There is absolutely nothing planned at all. Uh, you had some initiative taken in some other areas of this European pillar of social rights, like uh, skills, training, reskilling, upskilling. There they did some stuff. Um, but when it comes to worker involvement in corporate decision making, nothing. And when I say nothing, is also nothing till the end of the current term of office of the European institution, because soon we will have the European election. So we don't expect anything to come up until best case scenario 2025. And yet there is a case, because I, I agree with Tony, we should make the case about why we need information and consultation rights. The case we have is climate change. I mean, you look at our industries, the impact of decarbonization on mm -hmm. our industries is massive. Digitalization, it was already the case. You have millions of jobs that are going to either change or be displaced, are they say, which mean dismissal, clearly, frankly. So we have to have a tool uh, to engage into the process of anticipating the impact of jobs. And one of the tools is information and consultation. I unfortunately, of course, have, and well, I don't know if it's of course, but I certainly have no answer to provide on how on earth we can mobilize further and, and increase interest. And my concern is that, again, it's not that the interest of policymakers, left wing, right wing, equal low level of interest, I must admit, but also from the rank of the trade unionist. As, as Tony said, it's burning everywhere. Um, it's also kind of a fight for us. We have to do a kind of internal um, a raising awareness campaign to our members and trade union organization to remind them that, hey, guys, if you say that you want to play a part in discussing the consequences of climate change and decarbonization on jobs, you're going to need some tools, and that is democracy at the workplace, and that's information and consultation. So progress is still limited, uh, but I still believe this is, again, a battle worth fighting for. Mm. Thank you very much, Aline, for that extremely spirited set of comments. Um, are there any further questions at all comments anybody who hasn't said anything ah oh, janet yes janet if you'd like to unmute and ask a question or make a comment hi yeah thanks hello. 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 nice to see you again very nice to see you as well mm. and my very nice to see um, everybody here and uh, i've very much enjoyed the meeting i had to be very quick so i've unfortunately got to dash off to another meeting in a moment but um, yeah, it's been really, really interesting presentations. I just want, wanted to sort of comment very quickly and, and just perhaps um, on sort of more recent TUC kind of, you know, experience on this area. Um, I mean, I very much agree with the points that um, several people have made that we have to sort of defend and, and make the case for, um, you know, democracy at work um, in, on a sort of fundamental level. Um, I and mean, I think the TUC has done that. We've probably done it most effectively or most kind of pointedly in terms of workforce voice in corporate governance. And, you know, we've put a lot of effort over the last kind of five, seven years since about 2014, really, um, in, on, in, uh, into that agenda. Um, and I think that did, you know, had, did have some success, however much not uh, as much as we would have liked by a long way but there have been some some changes in terms of the corporate governance code uh, that now you know require companies to put some things in place which are very inadequate but um you know but nonetheless it's kind of better than nothing i think um in terms we've always tried um to make the case that with board level um you know, worker directors, uh, you also need a sort of, you know, more of a works council type, you know, type body, that, which has a different role and is more focused on, you know, the kind of what's going on at the company on a sort of day to day yeah. level. Um, I think that that probably that layer, um, however much we would see it as part of the kind of, you know, part of the machinery, as I think Aileen put it, um, you know, European works council, you know, board level worker directors, um, uh, kind of works councils and you know crucially obviously kind of collective bargaining but I think probably um, it's fair to say that that's got slight the kind of ice uh, level works council has got slightly squeezed out of the debate in the UK um, I mean the last time that the TUC did a real push on it in 
you know, I think is probably around the two, 2000 and sort of 15, 16. Um, and I mean, what I would say is we, you know, unions were, there was still some uh, concern in the union movement specifically um, about the trigger and in an answer to, John's question, um, certainly some unions do have examples or did have examples then of um, situations where employers had tried to set up, you know, non-union channels and displaced unions um, kind of through through that, you know, through the sort of the ICE mechanism. Um, I mean, what hasn't come up and I think is quite interesting is that just um, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, and this was something that the Theresa, Theresa May's government put in place, but then there was a sort of time lag, you know, they lowered the trigger um, for the ICE um, regulations, which has had very little publicity. I think that is partly to do with the, um, you know, the pandemic sort of just swept other mm -hmm. things away. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, and we did do a little bit of work with the IPA on it at the time, but um, as far as I'm aware, it's not really had any impact on uh, increasing the number of, you know, ICE kind of requests and so on and so forth. Um, and just to sort of wind up, I mean, more recently, recently the TUSD did quite a lot of work, a lot of engagement with unions, um, not on ICE, um, it must be said, but on collective bargaining and sort of trying to put together proposals that um, the, you know, the, the union movement could as a whole support for, um, you know, improving the sort of, the well, extending significantly um, collective bargaining in the UK and particularly in the private sector where we are, you know, weak. Um, and in those discussions, and it's not the same as ICE, so I absolutely acknowledge that. Um, the, it, in those discussions, the, um, the, the sort of bottom up trigger was something that unions wanted to retain. Um, there was, and, you know, there was a, a lot of debate about it, about whether there should be a sort of, you know, a kind of a requirement for collective bargaining. Um, and, yeah, after all the discussions, it remains, you know, right of access to workplaces was very, very strong in there. Um, there's a policy in there that does aim to sort of address the disaggregation point that was made earlier. Um, and basically um, would give a union with recognition in one bargaining unit, unit the right to communicate with workers across the whole um, organisation or other in other bargaining units, you know, as the union just kind of chose uh, to try to sort of re, uh, re address the fact that at the moment corporate you know size and complexity is a sort of significant barrier to collective bargaining but yeah nonetheless the trigger mm -hmm. was um you know but still was is still there in sort of tuc policies and and it was you know that was kind of definitely what unions wanted so that is collective bargaining and union recognition not ice i should just to be really mm -hmm. really clear um but I kind of, I sort of suspect that we'll be talking about ICE and there were proposals to kind of get rid of the trigger. I think that they would, you know, the barriers and, and some concerns would probably remain, albeit we haven't discussed that specifically for a good few years now. Anyway, thanks very much. It's been a very, very interesting discussion. I'm afraid I'm going to have to dash to another meeting, but um, thank you very mm. much. Um, thank you, Janet. That was an extremely helpful set of comments, actually. Um, not least in terms of an update from the TUC, but also reminding us that the levels of uh, employee participation actually intermesh with one another. I mean, we are talking about the democratisation of the entire company. I mean, not just at Works Council level, or workplace level, but also through board level participation, which has been very much outside the remit of this particular seminar. But nevertheless, it's something we do have to, you know, keep very much in in uh, contact with. Um, I'm not sure there are any further questions. Um, one last call for questions, comments. If not, I will just, if I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but perhaps if Aline, Tony, Brian would like to make a, a final comment before I wrap up. We are coming to the end now. Um, I think we should stop on time. I'm aiming to stop at, at eight o'clock, which is actually nine o'clock for Brian and for Aline. I'm, I'm well, well aware of the time. Uh, but do, do any of our three speakers have a final comment? Any thoughts you'd like to leave us with? If you don't, you don't. I mean, I'm not, um, you don't have to. 
Right. I don't actually oh, see. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go on. I, I was busy trying to figure out how to unmute. <laughs> I, I think I got it. Um, one of the problems I have with events like this is, you know, you hear so many things and you get so many ideas and they start bouncing around the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. You know, this is really great stuff, you know, and, and it has been like that, you know, and the, and the questions have been, you know, and the, and the commentary has, has, has been fantastic. And of course, I, I'm, I'm now trying to make some sense of a lot of thoughts that are flying around the place but I, I i suppose you know as 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 i thought about it and and you know um it's almost like um, in the west of ireland there was a lot of depopulation because of, of of emigration people went to england and they went to america and you know and there were a lot of houses that were left empty and unoccupied for decades and then people started to go and buy these houses, um, but quite often they were very poorly built. Um, and those people spent an awful lot of time and money trying to fix up houses that were very poorly built. And despite all the time and money they spent, the houses were still fairly poorly built. And sometimes you'd be better to knock the house down and start again. And, and, and I sort of have that sense uh, and maybe that's a bit harsh, particularly for people who are in, 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 you know, very directly involved. You in revolutionary, you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I suppose as I as as as, as and, and, and and this is some of the, the some of the thought you know or these are some of the thoughts that you know were going on in my head and they don't necessarily make sense. Um, but you know I'm involved as as as, as you would know, Michael, um, in 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 workplace innovation, <clears throat> um, direct participation, and 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 you know those those, those issues in the context of, of workplace democracy, which is hugely important. And as 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 we've had um, previous discussions about you know the fact that it, I, I would certainly be of the view that workplace democracy is 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 is, is an essential component of societal democracy, which itself is under threat. So it, it it's it's not simply about workers. It's a, it's actually about the whole of society, in my view, the the issue. Um, but to some degree, I I'm beginning to wonder from on the basis of this conversation, do we do we need to reframe the conversation? Um, and because you know, Aline was 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 referencing the you know the issues of climate change and digitalization, <clears throat> um, and 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 <clears throat> you know those issues and and the attacks on democracy that we see across the world, <clears throat> um, they weren't there in the nineteen nineties to the extent that they are now, um, and and for the generations that are coming through. They're the sort of things that they connect into. Um, and, and maybe we need to, to sort of take a step back and say, yeah, we, 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 we need this. We need, work, we need workers to have a voice in their workplace and it needs to be a meaning of, meaningful voice. And they need to be in, involved in decisions that are made because they're stakeholders, legitimate stakeholders, the same as everybody else. But the thing is, you know, do we need to look at this from a different point of view and come at it again? Um, I don't know, but I have a sense that maybe there might be a value in thinking that through. Mm. Certainly for me, there'll be a value in thinking it through. Yes, yes. Thank you, Brian. Um, Aline. I very much like the idea of a revolution. So, Brian, that's at least two of us. Uh, I'll back you up. You with great pleasure. Well, Allez, three of us. That's the start of a revolution, guys. Um, no, and seriously speaking, that 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 is something to take uh, to be taken into consideration, like reframing the narrative. Because indeed, when you talk to the young generation, democracy at the workplace, they don't even understand what you mean when you say democracy at the workplace. And when you go technical with talking about ICE uh, or information consultation rights, they have no idea what it is. Uh, for them, um, worker involvement is when their CEO send them a direct email like they send to all the employees to inform about whatever development. That's what they feel is democracy at the workplace. So there's quite a work for us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe my, my last remark, which is really the trade union perspective on the discussion, is that our challenge is to make sure that we have information and consultation rights. We need them. We need, we need that they work, are implemented and respected. At the same time, we have to make sure that it is not at the detriment of trade unions. And I'm saying this because at the moment, you can see that trend in 
all European debates and not very specifically on information consultation, um, many attempts from our dear right wing uh, policy makers at getting rid of the word trade union in many draft European legislation and instead replacing by worker organization or works council. And we have to make sure that we're not entering also into a situation where trade unions are put into competition with those works council. Um, so there's kind of a challenge for us, raising awareness, changing the narrative and making sure trade unions are still in the picture. Mm. Thank you very much, Aline. Um, Tony, if you do you want to say last word? No. No, it's OK. All covered. OK. All right. Well, look, thanks, everybody. I, I will begin to wrap up. Um, I'm not going to try and uh, summarise such a complex discussion because, like Brian said, you know, my brain is kind of reeling. Um, all I would say, though, is that it's been said that works councils are a good idea without a constituency. Um, and to some extent, that view has been kind of uh, reflected here. But I would like to just comment on something that Aline has reminded us of the challenges in front of us, um, you know, ranging from digitalization and the gig economy, decarbonization, climate change, um, uh, Brexit, uh, COVID-19, Ukraine, I mean, you name it. Um, th these crises remind me, and somebody once said to me that the word, say, the word in Chinese for crisis is also the same word for an opportunity. I have no idea if that's true. I need to find a Chinese speaker one day to confirm that or not. But actually, crises can be opportunities. And very often you see a crisis in European history has provided the opportunity for a, something good coming out of it. I mean, I think that's true. And I think that it might, these major challenges, these huge challenges that Aline has reminded us of, um, are maybe the opportunity for helping to reframe that narrative along the lines that John has said, and well, not just John, but a number of you, that it is a question of first principles. It is a question of democratizing the workplace. We are all employment citizens, you know, at our workplace, uh, and not just at workplace level, but all the way up to the board level and beyond corporate governance and the whole lot. So I try to be positive when we end these seminars. And so, you know, the last thought I would leave you with is that, you know, if it's true, that a crisis is an opportunity or can be an opportunity, then heaven knows we've got enough opportunities to reframe the narrative. So on that basis, I will say goodbye, but I would like to say, just before I do that, I want to thank very, very wholeheartedly our three speakers, Aline, Tony and Brian, um, for your time, for your dedication to this seminar, and for your fantastic thoughts and for leading such a great discussion, actually, it's been a great discussion. And that's really, you know, thanks to you. And I know it's very late for you. Um, and so even greater thanks for that. Um, so a round of applause for our speakers. And um, I think we should, we should end there probably. <laughs>